We're often asked about the different styles of mountain bike and what makes them categorized as such. Now recently we've made videos on downhill and cross country bikes, both of those are in the description underneath. But in today's video we're going to compare two of the most commonly confused bikes, trail bikes and enduro bikes. The trail bike starts where the cross country bike leaves off. Now as we know cross country bikes these days can top out with around 120 millimeters of travel. Trail bikes start at about that point, so 125 millimeters or so, up to about 150. Now the whole thing with a trail bike is it's designed to be lightweight but durable and confidence inspiring. As a result you can spec these style bikes out for a variety of different style riding. They have slightly more relaxed geometry than a cross country bike so that's going to give you a bit more confidence and a slightly heavier frame set on these enables them to tackle a lot harder terrain. As a result you could spec one of these out to be a heavy duty cross country bike or a lightweight version of an enduro style bike so the category is quite broad in what you can do with them. The all mountain bike however different kettle of fish altogether. So at a glance, yeah, it can look similar. Now these are commonly referred to as enduro bikes thanks to the popularity of enduro racing. A slightly more apt name I think would be all mountain given what you can do on these bikes. They tend to have steeper seat angles, even more relaxed head angles on them, stronger componentry on the bikes which of course weighs a bit more and they have suspension travel anything from 150 up to 180 millimeters. Okay, so let's look at the frame designs on the bikes and just see what is exactly going on here. Now, the trail bike, unlike the cross country bike, is going to be a little bit heavier, but still lighter than the enduro bike. The whole point of these is to be a more durable version of a lightweight bike to ride all day on a multitude of terrain. Whereas the enduro bike, really the focus is being strong and delivering geometry on the bike that's going to handle the roughest of terrain. Weight of the bikes varies massively as well. You can have a trail bike anything from 11 to around 14 kilograms, whereas an enduro bike you can expect it to be 13, uh, even up to 17 kilograms, depending on the size of the bike and the componentry that's spec'd on there, depending on what the rider needs. Uh, they're a very different kettle of fish from the modern trail bike. In both enduro bikes and trail bikes, you can expect to see options in both aluminium and carbon fiber. And it's unfair to say that either of them are better because of the fact you can get excellent bikes in aluminium and excellent bikes in carbon. You have to choose what suits your purposes and what suits your budget. Geometry on trail bikes is more aggressive than a cross country bike, but it's nowhere near as aggressive as what you're gonna see on the enduro bikes. We will get into geometry shortly, but you can expect to find head angles in the region around 66 and a half, 66 degrees, something like that. And on enduro bikes nearer 64 and a half, uh, perhaps even 64, uh, which is closer to what a downhill bike can offer. Now suspension designs on both bikes varies immensely. You can expect to see anything from a classic single pivot bike through to four bar linkages with a swing link on the top tube there driving the shock, as you can see on this bike, or even a single pivot with a linkage to drive the shock like you can see on this bike here. There's very different approaches and everyone has a slightly different formula. Now you've got to remember though that on a trail bike, the bike is designed to be as efficient as possible. So the suspension, even if it has a similar amount of travel, because you can get 150 mil trail bikes and 150 mil enduro bikes, the way that the suspension feels can feel completely different between the two. Now a good example of this would be on a trail bike, you might have, for example, a lot of anti-squat built into the design, uh, especially in the lower gears, which means when you're climbing, the bike's not gonna be sagging up and down. It resists that using the anti-squat. Uh, it will have less anti-squat, however, uh, or they can do in the higher gears, which means when you're going faster on bumpier terrain, the suspension is gonna work better. Enduro bikes will definitely have elements of anti-squat, but perhaps they can have less because really it's about the quality of suspension travel that's more important on the enduro bike. The thing with anti-squat is if you have more anti-squat, you can actually have a harsher suspension action, less anti-squat, and you can have a much more active platform there. So it does vary between the bikes, but the trail bikes are typically built for efficiency over anything else, whereas the enduro style bikes are built for outright capabilities on rough terrain. 
Now, although there's exceptions in both categories, it's more common on a trail bike to be able to climb without having to use the climb switch or a lockout or any additional compression than it would be on an enduro bike. Quite often on enduro bikes, you might see things like a coil shock, in which case you're really gonna to wanna to make the use of having some kind of climb switch or lockout because there's a lot of suspension travel to move around when you're climbing. As I said, efficiency versus capability. Now, in terms of geometry on the bikes, they can have some similar uh, things going on, but also some very different ones. So moving up from the cross-country bike, they will have a much steeper head angle uh, and a shorter reach on the bike, a shorter wheelbase and a longer standby comparison. Most modern trail bikes come with anything from a 30 millimeter stem up to probably a 50. Uh, they're probably topping out in that region. Wide bars, anything from 720 up to 800 millimeters are commonplace. Again, that is a rider preference thing. There's no like fixed rule on what you should have. The stem length will be reflective of the actual length of the bike and of course your height and preferences. Now the seat angles on the bikes varies massively as well. Uh, on a much bigger travel enduro bike, you will always need to have a slightly steeper seat angle to maintain your position when climbing. Otherwise the whole bike is gonna be sagging around. Whereas on a trail bike, it doesn't have to be quite as steep. That said, you can have seat angles anywhere from 75 to around 77, whereas on an enduro bike, anything up to nearly 80 degrees on some extreme examples. Uh, but the late 70s is roughly where you're seeing modern enduro bikes with seat angles. Chain stays tends to be slightly shorter on the more responsive trail bike, anything from 430 up to around 440, depending on the brand and the size of bike. Whereas on the Enduro bikes, you can expect to find chainstays up to 450 millimeters, which is much closer to what downhill bikes have. Now with suspension in terms of travel and suspension units, things vary immensely across the categories. As I said before, on the trail bike, you can have anything from 125 up to 150 millimeters. And you can typically find a suspension fork on the front having about 10 millimeters more travel. This bike, for example, is running 130 on the rear and 140 on the front. It's quite common to have more travel on trail bikes, whereas cross country bikes tend to have quite matched travel in general. With the suspension forks themselves, you'll find 34 millimeter stanchions as the absolute minimum. On a trail bike, you won't find skinnier forks than that. But you can have anything up to 36 as you see on this bike, which is a bit stiffer and a bit more capable. On the Enduro bike, you're gonna have a minimum of 36 and up to 38 millimeters, uh, as you're seeing with the new Zeb and the Fox 38 that's on this bike here. That bit stiffer, that bit stronger, offers more control for a better support on a bigger travel fork. When it comes to the actual shock absorbers themselves though, they vary too. Now on trail bikes, you can have regular air shocks or like this bike here, this one has a piggyback on there for slightly better response, uh, better performance in more demanding conditions. It's a great option, but it does have a weight penalty versus a regular air shock. On the enduro bike, you're pretty much always gonna find a shock that's got a piggyback. And more often than not these days, you're gonna find a coil shock on the rear for optimum performance when it's really rough. And with wheel travel on the enduro bikes, you'll find anything as we explained before, 150 up to about 170 on the rear and up to 180 on the front. Gearing on both trail and enduro style bikes is pretty similar these days to be fair. Most modern bikes will have a one by 12 system. So that is a single sprocket at the front and 12 on the rear. Now, of course you can still get some bikes running a double setup on the front, which just means you get more gears on the bike. But really one by 12 is a fairly common approach on both styles of bikes. Crank length, however, does vary. The trail bike is more about your pedaling efficiency. So you tend to have cranks 170 millimeters and perhaps 175. Whereas on the enduro bike, it's about ground clearance because you've got more suspension going on, you're riding them in much more demanding terrain with rocks and stumps. So you can have cranks as short as 160 millimeters. Again, depending on the rider height, the travel of the bike, that sort of thing, uh, but massively different. More about efficiency, more about control. So you've got two different beasts, although they do look kind of similar. Disc brakes, again, on both bikes, it is about control, of course, uh, very powerful brakes, but you'll have a slightly more lightweight bias on a trail bike. 
you can have anything from two pot brakes up to four pot brakes. Uh, my bike actually has a four pot on the front and a two pot on the rear. I don't need quite as much power on this bike. It's very easy to lock up the back wheel. Disc rotor size, you can expect to find at 180 millimeters and perhaps a slightly larger 200 or 203 on the front with the trail bike. Whereas on the enduro bike, maximum stopping power. So you're gonna have four piston or four pot brakes front and rear and minimum of 180 on the rear and 203 or 200 on the front, but anything up to 200 or 203 on the rear and 220 on the front. All about stopping power and maximizing on that on the roughest tracks. Uh, as for wheels and tires, there's definitely some similarities between the two and it really depends what you're gonna be doing with the bike. Now with the wheels themselves, you can get alloy wheels and you can get carbon wheels and of course, lightweight wheels and heavy duty wheels. On a trail bike, you've got the benefit of specking it as you want. So you can have some super lightweight, virgin on cross country wheels, if that's your intention for the bike, all the way through to proper enduro capable wheels as I've got on here. But you might notice I have trail style tires. So although they've got a heavy duty tread on them, the casing is much lighter, so closer to what a cross-country tire would offer compared to an enduro casing tire. Now this one at the moment does actually have the same tires on there, uh, but enduro casing tires are what you will see when the bikes are being raced. Uh, they're much thicker, four ply sidewalls, so more, like basically four layers of rubber there, uh, much closer to downhill tires in terms of the way that they're built. You can see different rubber compounds across both bikes. Uh, on a trail bike, you might have a slightly faster rolling rubber compound perhaps, whereas on the enduro bike, it's all about giving maximum grip in demanding conditions. So you'll have softer rubber and something with a very aggressive pattern. However though, as I say, there's no rule to the tires. It will be down to what you're actually doing on the bike. And you can have a bike with enduro spec wheels and tires on a trail bike and it could outperform. A, an enduro bike with the opposite on there, uh, just in terms of what the wheels can achieve. So it's a dramatic difference you can do between them. Uh, one last thing with the tires on the bikes, you can also spec tire inserts on the inside. So tubeless tires are fairly commonplace across the board with trail bikes and enduro bikes, but you can still split the tires when you hit rocks extremely hard. Now, it's, you don't see it quite as much on trail bikes, but I actually do like to run an insert on the rear just to afford myself a bit more protection. Whereas enduro race bikes almost certainly will have some form of insert on the tire there. Pedals on both style bikes tends to be down to rider preference. Uh, there'll be flat pedals or clips. If the rider's choosing to use clips, there'll be something like these pedals here, which although does have a clipless mechanism on the middle of the pedal, has a bigger cage than you would expect to find on the cross country pedals. It's a bit more sure footed, gives you more contact with your shoe and it protects the pedal mechanism as well. Uh, the flat pedal approach, of course, they're just gonna be what the rider prefers to have. There we go, they're the fundamental differences between the trail bike and the enduro bike. And as I said, they do look very similar at a glance and modern aggressive trail bikes like this one can handle a lot, but there's still not a patch on what a true enduro race bike can do. Uh, hopefully the video has been helpful for you. Uh, leave us some feedback in the comments underneath and we'll see you in the next one. Ta-ra.